<laughs> There's jazzed after the last episode. Yeah. You know, this week I can't promise Flavor Flav is going to be here, but... Oh! oh. <laughs> but we have the Flavor Flav of Kickstarter, Jake Bronstein in the building. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> So we'll be talking to him during the interview section. He raised over a quarter million dollars more than he asked for on Kickstarter, and he's going to share some of those secrets. We're also going to be talking with uh, William Sweeney about the uh, Neon documentary and Lance Seidman, who's the winner of the Social Goods Hackathon. Section starts. It'll be the third one. We have Melissa talking about events that you guys here and at home can attend next week. And then we're going to have Joe Mahone come and talk a little bit about one of my favorite things that we do downtown, and that's the speaker series. So... First off, this is Bill. We want to thank him because he is the one that's paying for all the beer that we're drinking. So thank you, Bill. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to let you talk. So you've got some stuff you're going to throw out at the crowd. But before you do it, give us a quick overview. What is somethinginked.com? Well, we are a uh, promotional goods and branded goods company. We specialize in giveaways, retail product, uh, everything from your cheapest to cheap giveaway to your highest end branded products. We do everything custom. Uh, we also do e-commerce stores, uh, web stores for people, uh, company stores, so you name it. Anything you need a logo on, whether it's a giveaway or whether it's a retail line, that's what we do. Okay, and if startups want to get a hold of you, just go to the website? Yeah, our website is uh, somethinginc.com, and then uh, it's pretty easy on the profile page on the website. All of our email addresses are right there, but mine's pretty easy. It's billf at somethinginc.com. Okay. And uh, the most important thing is to remember is we're not a tattoo company because we always get confused <laughs> as being a tattoo company. Uh, we get a tattoo too. All right, so this audience just loves free stuff. Free stuff? Who doesn't they love free don't. stuff? But these guys take it to a whole new yeah? level. Yeah. Should we throw out some free stuff? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> oh, here's your baseball throwing. <laughs> All right, double mustache guy in the front row got double. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't get one, we'll leave the rest of it in the back. You can grab it on the way out. <laughs> Let's talk with William. So you're doing the uh, Beyond Neon documentary, and I want to hear um, what this audience can do to help you, and what's actually going on with the project. Uh, we've been shooting it for about just over the last year. We started shooting last March, and we kind of there was so many things going on. We we figured out that we really had to boil it down to characters and kind of figure out the key players and things. But then at this point, we kind of want people to submit kind of what they're working on because those are stories that we might not see. There's a lot of things you see in, in media and and those kind of things, and those are the stories we cling to, but, you know, like even in here, you know, you have like Open Fire, Room Champ, you know, Evasive, those kind of things. Those people who have interesting... <laughs> Mustaches in the front <laughs> Who have interesting stories, you know, right. who... And, and that's... We're going to go towards a festival crowd, which is the creative class, and that's what we want to continue to draw here. Okay, so the goal is to get into all of their lives and find some interesting, interesting stories, right? Yeah, just find why they're behind the project that they're behind and, and kind of what motivated them to do that. All right, well, and then, uh, so it's their job to what? Go to a website? Yeah, they just in. go to mydtlv.com, and it's just a little submission form, and they send that, and then the ones that uh, will set up some interviews from there. Okay, and then when's this documentary going to be coming out? And uh, what's it should your... be during festival season next year. So it'll be completed by... November, December this year, and we'll do viewings that we can within like submission policies for festivals, and then it'll be festival okay. season next year. Sundance or something. And then what's the uh, the goal when people walk away from this movie when it's all done and they watch it? What do you want them to experience? Just really, to learn just, about our community, just to learn about it? our community, and you know, feel inspired that that it's not just you know when when you view it from other cities, and as we've talked to people from other cities, you know. It's it's a very boxed look when you see it just like on TV or in papers or whatever. And, and we feel like the project we're doing really lets you experience the lives that people live down here, and and that'll be inspiring enough to be able to either do something like that in your own community or come here and explore that option. Gotcha. Mydtlv.com. Uh -huh. Mydtlv.com. All right. So you guys check it out and tell them about your drunken anecdotes and <laughs> companies you created during that time. So talking about companies starting out of nowhere, you won the re most recent hackathon. I did. So, uh, yeah, tell us about yeah. that, Lance. Uh, Microsoft, NetSquared, and uh, TechSoup actually had a hackathon for uh, apps for social good. Uh, the ideas, you know, apps for social good, uh, ones that you don't 
technically charge for, um, and things that will help people. So in my case, I made one uh, that helps people find medication um, cheaper, or at sometimes uh, absolutely for free. Uh, so if you don't have health care or uh, limited health care, it'll help you find medication um, according to where you're located. That's brilliant. <laughs> That's really cool. Brilliant. Brilliant. Is it even a competition? <laughs> <laughs> I love this audience. Yes, save me again, thank you. <laughs> but uh, so tell me, what uh, inspired this whole um, competition? And did you? Uh, oh, this is cool. What is this thing? <laughs> and did you? And who, who else was another uh, runner-up that you that had a cool product? Well, for Windows Phone, nobody. What, uh, uh, what the is next, it? Well, this is actually. It was originally going to be a smart uh, watch, which I was then told. I cannot beat Apple. Basically, I'm going to take on the idea of a tricorder like on Star Trek. Love so it. you slap it on, it'll tell you your temperature, pulse, uh, eventually blood pressure. Um, but there's new technology now where we could actually take a video of you and uh, based off of your, uh, I don't know if it's technically how much blood in a certain spot, uh, Toshiba is actually coming out with it. Um, so you don't actually have to put something on a finger or you ear. Sure. Yeah, how are you doing? And more importantly, <laughs> it's a slap bracelet. So eventually you could go to the doctor's office and uh, just literally slap it onto a patient. Or the more importantly, because I did win money from it, it, I'm trying to make it as cheap as possible so that you and everybody else could just pop it on at home and kind of try and guess what is wrong with you. And then you kind of go to that doctor that's been right, going to right. school for 10, 12 years and get a second opinion because that's really where we're headed uh, to make it so everybody can afford uh, some kind of health care whether it's a $30 band uh, with a whole bunch of sensors which are getting super cheap and bendable which is yeah. extremely is it a really lot. good idea to slap patients like... <laughs> slap, <laughs> slap well that's the benefit them. if they can't right. help you you know yeah. Yeah, well, I like, yeah, I like your, I like your uh, passion for hardware. Because the first time we met you, you came to the podcast and you had, had created a t-shirt, right? That right, a video cut, shirt. Yeah, yeah, you put some iPhones inside it, you cut That's some squares correct. in it. You so can you send can... information to it, and eventually the idea was to put a camera there so you could stream information kind of first person, but more importantly, to advertise a company on there. So like at CES, I heard a complaint. People couldn't get people over because they had a small booth or whatever. So if they had video playing on their front or back of their shirt, uh, kind of caught people's attention. Gotcha. Okay, any URLs you want to send people to? Uh, basically just the Windows Store, uh, okay. which it'll be available for Windows Phone and... Uh, uh, What's it called? Windows 8. Uh, for the app itself is uh, Health Center, okay. and it's free and it's okay. available for awesome. Oh, congrats on the win, yeah. yeah. Let's uh, go back in time and see what downtown Vegas was looking like. So I was born in 88, so this made me giggle when I got the right, so they had, about this. I was like, they had your mom bringing you home right there. Aww. You don't have to clap in, but that's oh. okay. That's okay. I'm glad Sorry. you did. Because our next guest is an entrepreneur, internet personality, and blogger. Together for Jake Bronstein. Hey. All right. So, let's, so, so you've, got, you've got a couple of really important skills that a lot of people in this audience are developing. So let's talk about branding to start with. Yes. Um, or we can start about mustaches. I like how you just grew that one. Well, I branded myself. Yeah. So yeah. Well, can we get an updated picture? Who's on this? Do startups need a brand or are they too small for one? 
Uh, I kind of think everything needs a brand, actually. I mean, I, or, or maybe I hate that answer. I don't know. Like, like what, a, a brand is a very know, funny thing, it. right? So a brand technically isn't what you create. You create assets, you create a logic, you create a story, but a brand is what other people say it is. So, you know, yeah. like Coke has a vision of what their brand is, Walmart has a vision, but if you stop 100 strangers in the street and you go like, what is Walmart to you? Half of them might say, like, mm -hmm. you know, cheap crap from all over the world, right. and that's probably not what Walmart wanted, but that is their brand. <laughs> that's what you consider their brand. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, in an, in an ideal world, we've all created brands. Other, other people might have uh, complete visions of what it is you're up to, and those visions would be just what you want them to be. Okay, so everybody gets a brand no matter what. So you probably kind want of. to be in control of it. What would you For do? For people, you call them a reputation. Okay. <laughs> for, for companies, you call it a brand. But same concept, right? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. So, okay, so what would you do if you had to maximize some money? So say you had $5,000 and you wanted to really create a brand out of it. What would be the most uh, bang for the buck you could get? Uh, well, that's, that's sort of a tough question because it would be business specific. But it is something that I, that I think about a lot and that I play with a lot. And I think what, what it Pandora, all boils Pandora, down to. Pandora of cats. Go the Pandora it. of cats. I don't get it. How would you brand it? Oh, the Pandora. All right, okay, all right, got it. The Pandora. Right, of right. Cats. This is our fictional company. Right. Okay. Well, that one probably has a pretty clear brand from minute one. I think it would be the Pandora of Cats. Is okay. what you would hope people would say. Uh, you know, my Pandora of Cats. Like, well, what do you think of it? it well, it, you know, that's like the Pandora of Cats. They would say right. if you if you've gotten oh, it well, right. So we don't even need the five thousand dollars. Yeah. Right. right? Like five yeah, K. Just... You, you you got it in one sentence so well. But like, but I think you know because because we're we're sort of all internet focused and so with my company Flint and Tinder what we're trying to do really is accomplish uh, what Ralph Lauren did in 40 years in something like four and the way that you do that is by telling stories so that people more quickly feel passionately and and okay. you know get a hold of that brand vision and I think that's something that is uniquely uh, available for people to do because of the internet because like, like to, to plug it into the Ralph Lauren story, when that guy started 40 years ago, he was selling neckties to uh, you know, department stores and hard to know how the consumer would feel with a necktie, you know, like right. what he would think about that company. But now you might launch a Shopify site and you could, you know, you could tell this long story there and you would have a video maybe about you know, what's important to you and why you're making this necktie and all that kind of stuff. And so you could start sculpting a brand and, okay. and really make that impact, and it probably wouldn't cost 5K. Yeah, so, so actually, the, if I'm hearing it right, it sounds like a uh, startup might even have an advantage, right? Because you have just a few people that can tell some great stories that represent the whole brand, whereas a big company maybe... A startup kind of actually, in that, in that context, has a really powerful advantage because I've, you know, I've also I've worked for Fortune 100 companies as a marketing consultant, and what happens is if you go, you know, geez, you're, you're like in the, you know, you're in the mattress business, and so, you know, we should have like the world's biggest mattress jumpathon. And <laughs> what we're trying to right. say is that your mattresses are fun. That company might go and, and often does. Well, listen, guy, I do a billion dollars in mattress sales per year. And while that sounds really fun, uh, you know, we're one sprained ankle away from changing my brand in a terrible way. And so it's not worth it to risk it. Let's not. Let's do right. nothing. Let's like. Let's talk about all the things we could do so that we feel like we explored it. Let's do nothing. Whereas a startup, you know, you have a blank yeah, cam canvas and you have nothing, you have nothing but gain. There's no risk. You, you right. can tell your story in a really authentic and transparent way. And I think, I think that really connects with other people because, you know, the stories that Walmart might tell you today feel as manufactured right. as the situation that I just told you. You know, they hired a hundred consultants, they heard their thousand different ideas, they ran it through a million different test groups, right. and they came up with this one shitty idea, and it's like a commercial, whereas like, you can just sit in front of a camera yeah. and tell it in a, in a really compelling and truthful way. And I think right. well, like, the only good story yeah. they really have is the Sam Walton story originally, right? It was just when he was really building the whole company. Right, and, like, and, and yeah. that was a guy who was like, I'm gonna build a company around value and around this and around that. And, and now I think if you and ask that people- resonated, yeah. It resonated, yeah. It was like, they go to one place, they get a good value, but now maybe Walmart represents something different. Um, and so my company started on Kickstarter. It cost right. less than $5,000. Uh, 
Uh, and though you said we, we exceeded expectations by a quarter of a million dollars, it's not true. Uh, we actually exceeded expectations by $1.25 million oh, uh, between the ask and the, and the receive over two different campaigns. That's incredible. Congrats. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, let's transition over to Kickstarter. Um, so, is that, do you credit the same things you were just talking about with the branding to that success? Absolutely. So, so Kickstarter then, I think in a lot of ways it distills down everything that I think is magical about the internet opportunity right now. Because the workflow that somebody goes through when they go to Kickstarter is there's like a story up in front. You know, you expect to see that before you look at the at the like product description and ask yourself, am I interested in this? Right. And so, you know, you, you kind of, you log into that website or you, people don't, I don't know, whatever they do. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you go there and you expect that like for at least a minute, you're gonna hear something before you see something and you're gonna make that decision. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's uniquely suited for it. It's the very essence of, of what it is that I'm saying. And, uh, and I highly encourage okay. others to give it a shot. Okay, so, yeah. so um, the DNA of, uh, of a great Kickstarter project is so important. How would you um, tell people to, to create that DNA and like how should they go on Kickstarter and get their company started? Good questions, all. Kind of. I mean, they're like fair questions. I've, I've heard them before. I don't know. They're fine questions. Yeah, yeah they're pretty. pretty Whatever. Manufactured. They're just questions. They're like questions. I got them at Walmart. Yeah, it's totally. That happens. They're imported questions of questionable value. But, um, but should they change their whole company if it's not, I mean, if it's not kicking on Kickstarter, is it not a good idea to start with? No, I think what happened there, and so Kickstarter actually just started putting more metrics in. Like you as, the, as a Kickstarter oh, okay. creator, you can see that. how many views a video gets versus how many, uh, you know, backers you get. And I would say like if, oh, if I... under 48 hours or, or in the first 48 hours or 72 or whatever, uh, you notice that those things are out of whack. The way that you would A-B test a website, you, right. you would want to do the same thing here. You know, the, you, your product is a fixed thing that you've decided to do and you're committed to and you've worked on that. But there's something in the story that you're telling that's not connecting. It's not converting. I mean, the same way that with my website, if, the, mm -hmm. if I noticed that all of the traffic was bouncing off the homepage, I'd go, it's yeah, probably time to redesign the homepage. Um, I, I think what a lot of people miss about Kickstarter is that it, it is like... It's a website in that regards. You know, you don't you don't set it and forget it. You gotta you gotta work on it. And if the if the conversion isn't happening, it's probably okay. the story that you told. Yeah, that makes sense. And so when you did Flint and Tender, did you have some other ideas you were about to go out there with? And then this one was the one that you knew would convert the best on Kickstarter. Well, so okay, so here's what happened, right? Uh, you mentioned a couple different business endeavors, and one was Buckyballs. That was a four-year thing. We took a two thousand dollar investment and translated it into fifty-two million dollars in sales, really? seven thousand U.S. accounts, twelve countries, uh, and one fantastic that battle with incredible. Congress in the end. But uh, for the magnetic balls, right? for the magnetic balls, okay, yeah. Just making sure. But in between Stupid Congress, the time in that I business. left there. And, and the time that I figured out Flint and Tinder, I was trying to do something, and I didn't know what that was. And so I spent a year considering different ideas. And with these ideas that I'd consider, one that I was really excited about, I thought I'm going to make bed sheets. And, and I had this like, yeah, like excited. Yeah. I could be the Warby Parker of bed sheets, <laughs> right? And so I set up a web page, and I, and I designed it, and I pretended like I had a brand and a product, and I certainly had a price, and I did AdWords around it. And when at the end of two weeks I had spent six hundred dollars and my bed sheets weren't converting, whenever somebody would buy, I'd send them an email right away and I go, "This is so embarrassing. Uh, we're actually just designing the website. It's not meant to be up and running. I've refunded your money. We'll send you a, a promo code. You know, when it's ready to go, we'll give you fifty percent off." But I was just looking for that conversion rate yeah. because, you know, if it wasn't there and it wasn't there, then there was something broken in the story. There was something broken in the idea. Um, and so Flint and Tinder actually, somewhere in that process of setting up websites to see what worked in the way that I wanted it to work, uh, I, saw, I saw Kickstarter for the first time. I saw a thing on Kickstarter. And in my sick head, I thought, you know what? That's like an even faster, better way to do this because I don't have to set up a whole website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can just make one video and test an idea. And so Flint and Tinder, the original thing with the underwear, was meant to be the test of an idea. I set the dollar amount that I was asking for 
at nearly the highest dollar amount that had ever been raised on Kickstarter in a fashion project, and I just thought that would be impossible to get to. But really? if I crossed a lower threshold, then I would know it was successful, yeah. and I would have months to figure it out. And what happened was it ran away from me, right? So yeah, like, I, I asked for fifty thousand dollars. We got up to three hundred thousand, and actually, I realized at the end of like week one that I didn't have this thing figured out enough. And so I stopped promoting it. And, and, and by the end of week two, I realized that I was probably going to lose a buck on every new backer coming in. And it started scaring me. You know, how am I going to deliver on this promise uh, when it's losing right, money, right. not yeah. gaining money? And I don't even know how we're going to do it. But uh, that level of ignorance, I think, is actually really powerful. Beneficial. <laughs> yeah, because like... <laughs> Because if, if you walk up to anybody who's done any business, right, go, walk up to Tony Shea, stop him in the street, and go, hey, I'm, I'm thinking of getting in the online shoe business. What do you think about that? Right? And he'll go like, oh, I, I would not do that if I were you. And he's not saying it because he doesn't want you to be competition. He's saying it because he knows all of the trouble between right. I want a shoe business and, like, and where he is. And it's a mountain of trouble. It never ends, right? It's... It's a million problems that need solving. Right, and if you could see that up front, if you could see that up you'd front, you'd like, never do anything. I'm out. But you know, by the time uh, problem number two revealed itself in his world, he had solved problem number one, and so on and so on and so on. So it turned out making underwear in America was way harder than I ever thought it was going to be. But uh, you know, I had like three hundred thousand dollars worth of IOUs that needed delivering on, and that was that's a very powerful thing to move you through. And so. Right. At the end of that, while I actually still didn't have a business, I had proved some sort of model, and now I needed, I needed to figure something right. else out. And it was just another problem that needed fixing. Are you going to get Michael Jordan from Haynes? Uh, not only am I not going to get Michael Jordan from Haynes, but uh, <laughs> when, when you look under the hood of the underwear world, it turns out... Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But like, what do you, what do you, find? <laughs> you find that there's two companies really, and, and Hanes is among them that actually produce every single brand of underwear, no matter what wow. it is you're buying, no matter where it is you're buying it, no matter what the price point is, and it's very hard to compete with. I mean, it's a, it's sort of a, it's a bit of a locked ecosystem, but uh, you know, I didn't know that at the time, and and the which web, is good, which is how you got it done, right? Yeah, well, it's how I got it started. Okay, so it gives to people yeah. some URLs. We got flintandenderusa.com. Yes. Uh, anything else? We'll put that here on the lower thirds. But that's like the else? only thing. Yeah, go ahead. You no, know, that's it. Up. Oh, that's it. That's all. I, I mean. Okay, flintandender. I have a, USA. I have a Twitter com. account at Jake himself. I haven't tweeted in a year. I'm not that good at it. <laughs> if you send me a message, it's gonna like float in the ecosystem. What about Pinterest? You gotta be big there, right? Underwear I, all I, over. I, I, God. Not real. I mean, I have an email account. It's Jake himself at Gmail. If you, if you, if you, All right, email. If you want to send a message, I'll reply right, to Jake. it. Yeah. E email him when you get a chance. We appreciate right. you coming Thank out. You so, yeah, Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bridge School, a home to families of children ages six weeks to kindergarten, will be hosting a parent information session on May 23rd starting at 6 p.m. Co-create and collaborate with leading thinkers, researchers, and fields of neuroscience and positive psychology to help redefine the school experience. The school is slated to open in August, and you can find more information about it on ninthbridgeschool.com. If you happen to stop by the Far Farmers Market on the 24th, check out the Sound of Communication workshop from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. This class helped facilitate the growth, cultivation, and reconnection of interpersonal communication skills in a safe, quiet environment. After that, on the 25th, if you're looking for something more creative, check out Painting Hope at the Wood Connection. Create a painting, drawing, or wood piece that symbolizes what you wish to see in your future. This will be, there, there will be a gallery showcasing your creation to follow. This is for young adults ages 12 to 20. For additional information about all of those events, check out TicketCake.com as well. In keeping with the school theme, I think most of us remember watching Schoolhouse Rock, short animated music videos that help teach grammar, multiplication, and more. If you'd like to join in the nostalgia, bring your kids to Downtown Construction Zone on May 27th. Bring your own lunch and join with your family. More information is available on Skillshare.com. And if you're well-versed or newbie in Ruby on Rails, join Hack Night at Lib on the 20th starting at 6 p.m. Chat with others and find out more about this monthly gathering on meetup.com. 
Let's hand it over to Joe to talk more about Downtown Speaker Series. All right, Mr. Joe. So when people ask me what the best part about living downtown is, I consistently say it's the Speaker Series, right? Awesome. Like you've had <laughs> so many amazing people. We've got this new theater coming, but tell us about uh, what the Speaker Series is for those that don't know and what to expect coming forward. So easiest way I can describe Speaker Series, it's kind of a collection of informative and inspirational speakers from around the world. We liken it to TED, it's a little more in-depth, it's 45 minute talks. The difference is I try and, we try and pull the why out of the speaker, so rather than just what you're doing and why you're so amazing, why you're doing it, what that trigger point in your life was, what the catalyzing point in your life was for that goal. Right, and what are some of your favorite speakers that have come so far? Oh geez, um, I'm a, I was a big fan of Troy Carter, I'm a huge music yeah, junkie, yeah. so okay. Lady Gaga's manager was amazing. Uh, we've had genetic scientists from Israel, we've had artists, it's pretty well done. Right over, yeah, because yeah, I think of it a lot as a, a TED conference. Now, what uh, is going to be coming up, and especially what about the theater? When is this going to be open? So I, I don't can explain the project too. I yeah. don't have an exact date on the theater. Um, with construction, it's obviously kind of arbitrary. Um, I'm hoping by October 1st it will be open, because we're hoping to have some talks in there for the Life Is Beautiful Festival as part of their speaker series. Um, it's going to be a 150-ish seat theater. It'll be two stories as part of that whole building. So there's also going to be a bar, there'll be a cafe, there'll be an espresso lounge, there'll be a co-working space. But the main focus is the theater. So eventually we'll be able to have a five-camera setup, we'll have full stage lighting. We're going to run five yeah, of the Fremont East welcome. studios. So they'll be able to live cut it at Fremont East and then live stream it to the world as well as broadcast it to the Learning Village, which we're mm -hmm. launching in two weeks. Um, Speaker that I'm really excited about, on June 1st, we have a guy named Sean Swarner coming in. So he's the only person in the world that we know of that has survived both Hodgkin's disease and Askin's sarcoma. He had a lung, one of his lungs removed, and then he went on to climb all of the highest peaks on each continent. So he's climbed all the seven major peaks. He did an Ironman two years ago. He runs marathons consistently, and he has a cancer foundation. So he's coming in on June 1st. Then we also have, uh, we just booked David Copperfield at the end of the year, which I'm pretty Ooh. excited about. Yeah. And um, who's the other one? Ben, Col ben Goldhurst is the founder of Good Magazine, which I'm pretty excited about as well. So he's coming in mid-June. Okay, and are you going to be amping, amping up the frequency? Or if you, especially if you have your own theater, what's going to happen with that? So beginning of June, we're going to have about five speakers in the span of a week and a half. I don't know if we'll keep that kind of density up through the rest of the year because we have to work around things like Catalyst Week and Tech Cocktail Week. But we're definitely trying to amp it up in general. Okay, and these are usually people staying at the Ogden for the crash pads, right? Or are, they, are you bringing them in just to speak sometimes too? Is it a mix? Most of them, now they come in specifically to speak. In the beginning they came in just to okay. visit and we kind of transfer that into a speaker series. <laughs> that guy right there. Um, so we got Jake. But moving forward, it's, it's just scaling at an incredible rate. So it's really okay. exciting for me. So give them the URL because you have the website up where people can see the so, old ones. Yeah, if you want to watch old videos that we put up or sign up for the distribution list and find out about upcoming speakers, it's downtownspeakerseries.com. You just enter your email address. It'll send you an authentication, and you're good to go. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, and thank you guys for coming out for episode 22. And that's it. So, here's up. Thank you guys. Remember like a flashback Vegas Tech Don't forget to spell it with the hashtag